Hello and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast. I am your host, the Freakish Lemon. I go by Adrian and I use masculine pronouns. Welcome any new viewers. Thank you so much for clicking on whatever you clicked on to get here. And welcome back any returning viewers. I appreciate uh, you following along with whatever I'm doing so much because you could be spending your time doing a million other things. Um, this is a crafty type podcast coming to you from the Northwest Hills of Connecticut. Uh, show notes for this episode and all episodes can be found at my website at freakishlemon.com. We have a group on Ravelry. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab and you will find us. And you can follow me at all the fun places if you like as Freakish Lemon, like Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, and Ravelry. That was all out of order and I lost where I was saying things. But if I'm there, I'm there as Freakish Lemon, and all the links to those things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube and you want to keep following along with what I'm doing, uh, hit that little subscribe button so that you know when I post a new episode or video or whatever I'm doing. Um... Yeah, I'm filming this on Saturday, December 2nd, 2017. Uh, trying to get back into Saturday recording schedules. That worked out better. <sighs> I've been recording on Sundays recently, and it's been slow to get the podcast out because of having to deal with work on Mondays. So, trying to get back into a Saturday recording schedule. Uh, podcast stuff. Blanket Make Along 2017. We are in the last month of it. Um, that means nothing other than work on some blankets if you want over December. Um, uh, all the details are in the Ravelry thread um, over at the Freakish Lemon Podcast group. Uh, but basically, work on a blanket in 2017. And we do have quarterly prize drawings. So there's one more prize drawing left if you have not participated in the blanket make along there is still time you don't have to start a blanket you don't have to finish a blanket you just have to be working on a blanket it could be something that you've pulled out of storage from 20 years ago as long as you put some stitches on it uh then you're good to go and it can be any craft knitting crochet weaving quilting whatever you want if you're working on a blanket it totally counts uh, which moves us on to some life stuff. I have a big block of text here, but um, <laughs> there's only three bullet points. So hope, hopefully this won't take all the time in the universe. Um, Christmas bazaars and craft fairs. Um, it's been three weeks-ish since my last podcast, I think. Um, so about three weeks ago. Um, the weekend before Thanksgiving, there was 80 bajillion holiday bazaars and craft fairs in my local area. Um, that's, yes, 80 bajillion is the exact number of <laughs> craft fairs that there were. Um, we went to a bunch of them. Uh, my mom and I went to four, four craft fairs, and we drove past a fifth. And if we weren't starving, we would have stopped and checked it out. <laughs> we were starving. Um, it was pretty awesome. I love going to local craft fairs. It's always interesting to see what people are making locally. Because um, I find that um, what we as makers are making in this kind of online community... Um, is sometimes very different to what people are actually making at home, especially if the the folks are traditional craft fair people who have been doing craft fairs for decades. So it's really interesting to go see, and I love seeing local craftsmanship. Um, we went to three craft shows in church basement, church basements which is like the traditional place to have a craft show in this area. Um, and then we went to one that was super cool. Um, when we came out of the third craft show, 
mom was joking like, oh, are there any other ones going on that you know of? And so I just did a quick Google search for the area and craft shows and, um, in the next town over in Bristol, Connecticut, there is a carousel museum. Um, and there was a, an event page saying that there was a craft fair at the carousel museum, which we were like, all right, we've never been to the carousel museum. We know where it is. We've driven past it. Um, but we've never gone. So we went to the Carousel Museum and it was a really, really cool craft show. Um, there were three areas of the craft show. The first area was in the first room of the museum, just kind of along the walkway with the exhibits. Um, the first, a lot of the stuff in the Carousel Museum is just, um, the typical, I don't know what you actually call those things as a functional piece of the machine, but, you know, the horse piece. <laughs> You'd have the horse and the pole, and that would be it. But they had, you know, like, a whole bunch of them in a room, kind of roped off in sections, and there was just tables lining those walkways, um, so that the vendors were basically backed up pretty much against the exhibits. And it was really, really cool um, to just walk into that space and it was surreal. It was an interesting atmosphere um, for a craft show. And then the second area was in um, a room that the museum uses to showcase local artists. There was a, an exhibit kind of going on about tattoos. Um, we didn't really walk around the exhibit because it was kind of separate from the area we were trying to navigate, but there was a, a piece of that area where they had some craft show stuff. And then upstairs um, in the Carousel Museum is a big wide open room, almost like a ballroom type area and there's like a couple of things that they have up there to look at as part of the museum but they rent that space out so that um so you can do events there and stuff so there was um you know like tables along one wall table along the other wall and then like a center aisle of tables so you had like a big oval to walk around um and the upstairs it was a really really cool craft fair to go to um and a really cute cool museum we're definitely thinking about going back to actually go through the museum um and it's just a really cool space the building is an old factory that they took over um so they have the carousel museum and then they actually have a um fire history museum uh kind of a small next door, and then a Greek art and history museum as part of the building as well, uh, which is really cool. Um, so if you're a Connecticut local, it's definitely a cool place to check out. Um, or if you need a, an event space, you can rent the upstairs of a carousel museum. Only downside is parking. It's, it's not an easy place to park at. We ended up just parking on the street <laughs> outside of the parking lot because it's a very small parking lot and it's a very weirdly shaped area to park. But that was super cool. And then that same day I went to a Friendsgiving. Um, some friends of mine from college started putting on a, a Friendsgiving. Or maybe they were doing it before and I wasn't a part of it for a while, but you know, whatever. But it, it was super great to go hang out with them um, and do food. And I brought spinach artichoke dip, which everybody loved. And it was completely gone. I came home with an empty container. Didn't even come home with crackers or anything. Because <laughs> I brought pita chips and crackers. I came home with just the empty bowl, which was pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, it was nice to see everybody and hang out. Sorry, I had to readjust the camera. Things were happening. Anyway, yes, so that was fun. And then there was actual American Thanksgiving, 
which was full of food and deliciousness um and the parade and watching the dog show with my dog <laughs> which is the best um although she wasn't really interested in the dog show until I started poking her in the face to watch the herding group because that's the important group that's the group that the corgis are in um but the first dog to walk for the herding group was a german shepherd and my dog loves german shepherds penny the corgi loves german shepherds so she was thrilled to see one on tv <laughs> um and then obviously this is december 2nd when i'm filming this so christmassy things are in full swing which is why I'm seated here in my like print and ship corner <laughs> that's because I have a Christmas tree set up um I was originally gonna put this on a table but it's just at the most awkward height ever if it's on one of my folding tray tables it basically blocks the entirety of the shelves uh so, I can't get to my Lego Star Wars advent calendar or anything if this tree is on a table in front of the bookshelves and there's really nowhere else to put it right now. Um, so it's on the floor. So I figured I'd sit here with my tree on the floor and we can ignore my printer and my humidifier because everything is dry and awful. <sighs> I'm prone to nosebleeds, so <laughs> I kind of need extra humidity in this room um when the the heat kicks in because the amount of times i was waking up nosebleeds was delightfully too many too many times waking up with nosebleeds but i'm i'm prone to that kind of thing uh anything else going on uh by the time you'll have seen this i'll have gone to the uh Chris christmas gift show at the AquaTurf in Southington slash Plantsville. I, the address says one thing, but everybody always says it's in Southington. Uh, where Gabby will be vending. Um, but if you didn't know about it, it'll be too late by the time you see this. So it, it will probably have been very busy and overwhelming and kind of awesome. Um, we're gonna go just to go shop around. Uh, and, you know provide backup to Gabby if she needs it in her booth and we did a lot of Christmas decorating today um because not only did I do my stuff we did a good chunk of the stuff all throughout the house so we put up our two Christmas trees and decorated them and put up a whole bunch of stuff um the Christmas village and the nutcracker table and all that kind of Christmassy stuff that we put up every year. Um, yeah. The only thing that's not decorated for Christmas is my desk at work because we're moving offices this week. This week. By Friday. Well, Friday I'll be working from home because that's the day they're actually going to close the doors lock it and uh kick us out so they can move all the computer stuff and get us set up in the new place which is the source of all the stress right now so that's fun uh so we're gonna ignore the rest of my life <laughs> and say life stuff is done um and move on to finished objects because i have some First thing I want to show my finished objects real quick is um, my Classy Squid Fiber Company Samples Hand Spun. I showed you them in the ball last episode, but I, you know, washed them and skeined them up. And they're tiny little mini skeins, but they look very good. And I'm pleased with that. And then the next thing I finished, if I bring myself back into focus, are my knitting machine mittens. I use the pattern Basic Hat and Mittens uh, Two Needles by 
which was put out by Patton's. Um, I did these on my knitting machine, the Silver Reed LK150, in some hand dyed Cormo. Um, I picked up the Cormo on the I 91 Shop Hop in South Deerfield, Massachusetts. I don't have any of the other information handy for that yarn, but these are my finished mittens. And they're blowing out the camera like nobody's business because this camera gets very excited about oranges. Um, and this is how they fit my hand. Uh, once I ripped back on the hand, um, and then I kept the decreases the same, so it was every row instead of every other row, they fit magically. The thumbs are long, but they're not as long as the hands were. So I'm not really that fussed about the extra half inch in my thumbs. But now I have a pair of mittens. Um, they were super easy to knit. And this um, pattern is written for hand knitting. So if you want to knit flat mittens and seam them up, it's definitely doable. Um, the only thing I would change about doing this on the machine is I would change the order of the body versus the thumbs. In the pattern, it's a free pattern. In the pattern, it has you get up to the thumb, you do your thumb gussets, and then continue knitting the thumb first, and then finishing it off, and then knitting the rest of the body. I would do it the other way around, um, doing another pair of mittens on the machine. I would get up to the part where you'd be knitting the thumb, and I would waste yarn it off and then finish the rest of the mitten. Um, just because putting this many stitches, the, the seam is here, putting this many stitches and the stitches for the back into holding position and then trying to just knit the thumb in the center was troublesome trying to get the weights onto the thumb in the middle on the knitting machine so that the stitches could form correctly. So I, it would be easier to do that central thumb bit if I finished the rest of the hand and then had all of that hanging while I knit the thumb. Uh, and then seaming up was no problem. I'm getting a lot of seaming practice. Um, so the seam is here on the thumb and then here on the body of the mitten, which is actually a pretty comfortable place for the seam to be. Um, the way this is sitting on my hand, the seam is actually right there, kind of along the back of my hand. Um, but I mean, these are identical mittens, so it could be, let's see, and it kind of falls on the same place either way, um, because of how my hand is shaped in the flat mitten. But I'm very pleased. Um, it's nice to have finished something on the naming machine. Um, that's relatively simple. Um, and a smaller project. Because uh, mostly, at least what I've heard about knitting machines, it's always been people making sweaters. But doing smaller projects on the knitting machine um, is also very doable. So that's exciting. Finished those mittens. Now I can wear them. And I also finished a hat that uh, you have not seen on this podcast. I don't think. Unless I showed you the ribbing, because the ribbing was on the machine for a while. Um, here is my hat. I did show this on Instagram, so you might have seen it on Instagram. This pattern is uh, the Snowflake Hat by Pattons. Again, another free pattern put out by Pattons on the same knitting machine. And this is leftover from my mittens. And this is a brown Cormo from Fox Hill Farms that I bought at Rhinebeck. And this is a pattern that's written for a colorwork hat knit flat. Um, let's see, where's my seam? Here is the seam. 
so it's a pretty invisible seam um, in terms of the pattern itself. And this hat was a learning experience. <laughs> um, I did watch a few tutorials about um, doing color work on the machine, which is actually a really interesting process. Um, just a brief explanation. You set my knitting machine has a carriage, the thing that I move back and forth, and it has levers on either side. And you can, there's a lever that says, I want to knit the stitches in ready position, or I want to not knit them. And there's a lever that says, I want to knit the stitches in hold position, or I want to not knit them. You basically set it up so that one side of the carriage will knit the stitches in ready position and one side will knit the stitches in hold position and you just kind of alternate back and forth with each of the colors. It's a really interesting process and if you're super interested I will try to film a video one of these days about doing it. Um, but it was definitely a learning curve. Um, I noticed that doing one side of the knitting was a lot easier to do than the other side because of where you change, like how you change your yarn colors on one side. For me, it was my right side because of how I prefer to start and stop the knitting. Um, so there was definitely some weird loose stitches on the right side and I did drop a stitch. Um, Let's see, can I tell which one it's in? It would be in this snowflake. I did drop a stitch somewhere. Um, and I was saved by a couple of things. One, this yarn is pretty grabby. It likes to hang on to itself. Um, and two, when you drop a stitch on the knitting machine, because of the way the knitting machine works and there's a needle for each stitch, if it falls off and you don't notice it and you keep going, it'll create a yarn over and then keep knitting. So you still end up with the same number of stitches that you're supposed to have. There's just a hole somewhere with a loose stitch sticking out of it. Um, so basically you just have to secure that stitch and there's no like you don't run into a problem of not being able to count the right number of stitches in your um, color work. So that was interesting to learn and to fix. Uh, there were a couple of weird stitches where I had to just duplicate stitch them to, because the tension was weird or um, or I zipped off the hat. I probably zipped it off twice by accident just because I didn't load the yarn properly into the carriage and just zoop, right off right off the machine got to put it back on and then I know I was stalling on the ribbing um, when I first put the machine on or when I first started knitting the hat because um, you hand manipulate the um, purl stitches in your knitting um, and because it's a brown yarn it was hard to work on at night and because the yarn was so grabby it was hard to actually ladder it down to the bottom you'd have to sit there and pick at it every single thing some some yarns it'll ladder pretty smoothly this one no you had to pick every single strand um which for almost a hundred stitch well it was almost a hundred stitches cast on so for about 50 stitches ish laddering down and then laddering back up it took forever i procrastinated for ten thousand years um i actually used the um cast on numbers uh for the child size hat but the um i sometimes i don't know what gauge these people are working with um because I know in a worsted weight yarn, and this is a tighter gauge than what I did for all those hand knit hats, um, I can't really comfortably get a gauge 
much tighter than this, especially on the machine where you have to shove all the needles. Um, Cause I knew the numbers that worked for me for um, the barley hat by Tin Can Knits. And I knew I was using a looser gauge on that. Um, so this is a slightly tighter gauge and it had maybe six, six or seven more stitches on the cast on for the child size hat. So I don't know what size heads people have. Usually for Tin Can Knits, I was knitting like a large hat like an adult large I don't, I don't know what I was knitting uh, I should not I don't know I usually end up having to make a larger hat for my head but as a child I don't know it's very weird but I'm thrilled with it and I'm excited to do more color work on the machine um, and kind of get those skills under my belt because um, it's super quick to do color work that way and you get really even tension because it's on a machine which is amazing. I wasn't keeping an eye on the time again, so if a bit got cut off in there, um, sorry. I'm not great at paying attention to things. It's nighttime now, I'm tired. I'm <laughs> just trying to film this because I know I'm a week late. Um, so that's it for finished objects uh, this week. Let's talk about some works in progress. Oh, I'm out of focus. So I've been doing a bunch of spinning. Um, I filled up another bobbin of the mystery fleece um, on my hitchhiker wheel. And I have, I think, three and a half bats left to spin. And that's really encouraging. Because it feels like I've been working on that fleece for my entire life. <laughs> uh, and then I've also been working on my pumpkin uh, spin. It's uh, this fiber. I don't have a label for it or anything. I got it at a um, on an Etsy dyer de-stash. They just had like two ounces of it just hanging around. Um, so here's my little singles. I re I rewound the turtles um because the turtles were getting all sorts of tangled. So I rewound them into these little balls and got a little turtle working there. So I'm probably two thirds of the way done with this. So trucking along, trucking along. Um this isn't something that I actively work on all that much. It's kind of what I'm using in place of hand knitting right now in terms of just having with me if I go somewhere where I might be sitting around for a while. Um, brought it to get my oil changed. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and then I did a little bit of spinning on... Um, these leftover bits from playing around with my drum carter when I first got it. I had these leftover from a large spin and I just kind of fed different colors from the same dye fiber through um, the drum carter just to play around with it. I had thought maybe I could um, ply this with the um, with these guys, but I think that would not work out because of these greens. So when I ply the beast dash together, um, if it looks really horrendous, I'll over dye it. But I did, oops, I did do one turtle's worth, um, oops, wrong side of this um, fiber. I don't recall off the top of my head what this fiber actually is, but it's something I ran through the drum carter and kind of blended the fall colors around. But, so that'll be my next um, 
Turkish spindle project uh, when I finish the other one. I just wanted to get it started just to have an idea of whether or not that would be a viable ply option. And then um, today, actually, I spun a bunch of uh, natural black alpaca from Alpaca Obsession. This is part of my um, alpaca shawl spin. I have a lot of bits of alpaca that will be going into a stripy shawl. Um, so I fin I've finished all of the black alpaca now. I just have one more thing of four ounce alpaca in a kind of fawn reddish color. So that'll be it. And then all of my alpaca bits will be ready to go into the shawl. So that's exciting. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. And then quilting. So I did a little bit of work on my Halloween strip quilts. Um, not the candy stripe quilt uh, yet because uh, my craft room has been otherwise occupied and laying out the long strips to cut them was not feasible for a little bit there. Uh, but I did um, sash together my um, strip squares. So this is just some black cotton that I had left over from something. Um, and since the cutting was in a relatively small area, I was able to do this more quickly. I opted to cut um, was it three and a half inch width sashing. Um, so I put each of the two squares together with a strip of sashing. And then I did the two horizontal sashes. I do have to square this side off because I'm not very good at straight lines. Um, so I do need to kind of square that off. And so this quilt top just needs um, a black border. Um, the I've finished off this black cotton, so I have, now I have to break into my six yards of black cotton that I bought from Affordable Fabrics a while back, um, which is a slightly different shade, but it'll, it'll work as a slightly different shade as a border and then a border in that stripey Halloween fabric. Um, and then I think it's ready to set aside for quilting when I'm ready for quilting, actually doing the quilt sandwich and quilting. Uh, so that's, been. Um, it feels like it's been forever since I worked on this and I probably finished it relatively quickly after doing the last podcast. Um, but I'm really enjoying quilting right now. Um, what else have I been working on? Oh, I've been, I've started, um, working on my sort of simple shawl shapes on the knitting machine project that I'll probably turn into a series of patterns on Ravelry just because there's not very much out there for machine knitting. Probably more than than what you'd think, but um, machine knitting is kind of a, a niche in the knitting world. Um, so I've started with um, an asymmetrical shawl using my Blue Ridge Yarns uh, Kaleidoscope in the kind of Halloween-ish color, colorways that I picked up at Rhinebeck, uh, and some Plymouth Galway worsted in black that I picked up on Small Business Saturday at my local yarn shop. Uh, I'll have put a video here of what it kind of looks like right now, which doesn't look very exciting and kind of looks like it's being tortured on the knitting machine with all the weights hanging off of it. Um, but it's a simple asymmetrical shawl uh, and a worsted weight. Um, for this project, I'm going to be doing the shawls 
kind of in varying weights. Um, I'm gonna have a worsted weight, a DK weight, a fingering weight, a uh, fingering weight held double. Um, I think that's it that I've got planned, but yeah, so I'm kind of putting that together. Um, if anybody out there machine knits and machine knits from patterns written for machines, if anybody's got some free resources they want to point me to as to how those patterns are written or examples of those patterns, um, that would be fantastic. You can shoot me a message uh, on Ravelry or um, leave a comment below here on YouTube, but um, I'm trying to, you know, I'm taking notes on what I'm doing for what this um, patterns going to be for the knitting machine and it occurred to me that I don't know if knitting machine patterns are written any differently from regular knitting patterns. Um, I mean I'm gonna go when I'm ready to actually write out the pattern go look at some you know free patterns on Ravelry to see what they uh, look like, but if anybody's got some favorites as to how their machine patterns are written, uh, I'd love to see them uh, just to make the process easier for everybody. And that's what I've been working on. So lots of spinning and I did do some weaving, but it still looks the same as what it did before, but I'm about a foot away from finishing the third panel in my weaving schlanket project. So that's exciting. Uh, so a little bit of new stuff. Uh, since Thanksgiving happened, that means that Black Friday also happened. I did not leave that. Well, I did leave the house on Black Friday, but it was not for Black Friday shopping. I needed to get an oil change in my car. And that was the only day available <laughs> to make an appointment because people are getting their cars ready for winter, um, which is a serious business here in Connecticut um, and, you know, New England because small curvy roads and lots of ice. Um, but I did go out sail shopping on Saturday. Uh, Joanne Fabrics had a kind of rolling out of sales. A bunch of stuff was 70% off on Friday, but a bunch of different stuff was very cheap on Saturday. And I'm gonna throw a video here that I took, uh, but on Saturday at Joanne Fabrics, um, fat quarters were 75 cents and a bunch of quilting cotton was 70% off. Um, some of it was 60% off, but you know, it was, more than half off. Plus there was a 50% off uh, non-sale item coupon for that day as well. So I got um, spray basting for half off, which was nice, but I walked out of there with an absurd number of fat quarters um, <laughs> because they were 75 cents and usually uh, regular price is 249 ish um, I usually don't buy them at full price, but I mean, 75 cents, it's nothing to shake a stick at. You just go and you grab whatever colors you need to fill in the quilting palette <laughs> is what happens. And that is exactly what happened. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys that fabric, uh, since I don't know when I'll be using any of it, uh, cause fabrics, I mean, we know that as knitters too. Sometimes you just buy stuff and you just let it marinate. Uh, I don't think that was the right word. You just kind of let it sit and, and let it decide what it wants to be. Uh, that's mostly how my fabric goes. It just waits and decides what it wants to be. But I'm thinking a bunch of it will go into quilts relatively soon. Um, I'm trying to pick like color palettes to do um, more strip quilt uh, experiments with. 
once I finish the um, tops that I'm working on now. And then I bought one other thing at that um, Carousel Museum craft show, and it's actually right over here. I'll bring it closer to you. There was a booth at this craft show by the Connecticut Woodworkers Guild, and they had these little... Let's see if I can focus on it. Nope. There we go. These little bark houses. Um... They had some bigger ones too, but they had these tiny little ornament ones. And that's just so cool. And I wanted to support really cool craft and it's a neat little house. So I bought a little house ornament, which lives on my tree. Uh, handmade ornaments. These were all handmade things. Not all of them were made by me. This was a gift in a swap from Mary Farmer Gurumi. I'm really bad at actual names, but Farmer Gurumi. And then this and my goat. Um, and this was made by a friend, a uh, cat, and everything else I made. Except for the tree. The tree is the only manufactured part of this thing. Um, yeah, but no other... And, and I bought some black yarn for um, the shawl that I'm knitting on the machine. Um, so no other major purchases since. And... I mean, really, I'm kind of purchased out for a while. I'm, I need to stash bust. So let's move on to other stuff. Um, stuff I'm listening to. I finished listening to The Millennium Falcon by James Luceno, narrated by Mark Thompson, um, which I enjoyed. I started listening to Outbound Flight, and I didn't put in my show notes who that's by, but it's... Is it narrated by Mark Thompson or Jonathan Davis? Oh no, I don't remember. But it's one of those guys. Because um, sometimes if I can't think of a book uh, that I want to listen to when my credits come up and I need to get a new book... Um, I'll just click on one of their names and go find a Star Wars book that I don't have yet. Because <laughs> um, they're both excellent narrators. Um, so I'm not entirely sure who that book's by or who's narrating it. Um, but it's a Star Wars book. It's a prequels era book. Um, and it's actually a pretty good precursor, uh, like a prequels type story to uh, the Thrawn trilogy because um, Joris, the Jedi Master, whose last name I don't know how to pronounce and they pronounce it differently in the Thrawn trilogy and this book, um, <laughs> is kind of some background on him, which is pretty cool to listen to um, so soon after finishing the Thrawn trilogy. And then I started listening to a couple of new to me podcasts. The first is a podcast called Homecoming, which is a psychological thriller from Gimlet Media. This is the quote from their website, starring Katherine Keener, Oscar Isaac, and David Schwimmer. It's about memory loss. Well, not memory loss so much as... Um, experimentation with drugs to make you forget things. Um, Catherine Keener plays a psychologist, therapist type person. Um, and Oscar Isaac plays a, um, a soldier with PTSD. I don't know if he's a soldier. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's a soldier because they start talking about he was kind of stationed more as like a 
guard duty at a post rather than um, frontline combat. Um, there, there's some kind of, you know, you got to figure out what's happening on context clues, especially at the beginning. Um, because there's no blatant explanation as to who this company is, why they're doing these things, who's contracting them to do these things. Um, but it's good. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, kind of a slow paced one. It's not keeping you at the edge of your seat gripping, but it was a nice, um, pace for listening to while I was crafting. So recommend that. And then I started listening to Eos 10, um, which is a fiction podcast. Uh, it's the stories of two maladjusted doctors and their medical team aboard an intergalactic travel hub on the edges of deep space, along with the deposed prince who's claimed the food court kitchen as his new throne. It's a very funny podcast. It's very well acted. And I love the scenarios they're coming up with. If you're a sci-fi fan, if you're if you're the type of person who likes the type of sci-fi like Deep Space Nine or Babylon 5 where it's space stations and the hilarity of dealing with um, intergalactic cultures and emergencies and ridiculousness and trying to keep a station running, it's that kind of humor, um, that kind of podcast. It's super fun. Uh, and then I have it here under listening to, because I'm not really watching it, but I've been listening to, um, the, the show Iron Fist on Netflix with the descriptive audio turned on. I had no interest in watching Iron Fist, um, as it's, uh, Marvel superhero TV show. Um, but I had tried to watch the Defenders, and was just not interested in the first episode. Um, but I loved uh, Daredevil, I loved Jessica Jones, I loved Luke Cage, so it was really annoying that I wasn't into the team-up show. Um, and I definitely got the sense that there were context clues missing. Um, because I hadn't seen any Iron Fist, but I had no interest in watching Iron Fist. Um, so I turned the descriptive audio on, which Netflix does a very good job with, um, the Marvel superhero shows. I haven't turned on the descriptive audio for anything else. Um, its purpose is for, um, the, for seeing impaired people to be able to enjoy the shows, but I find it helpful, um, especially if I'm doing other things instead of just sitting there and watching it, uh, to turn on the descriptive audio so it's more like an audio play rather than a television show. Um, and it's all right so far. I'm only a couple episodes in listening to it. Um, Yeah, every time I look up and see the characters, I'm like, I would not be compelled to watch this if I had to look at your faces this whole time. I Something about their expressions and their attitudes. It's just not... I'm not having a good time looking at them acting out the story, but listening to it. I don't know. That's working better for me. I mean, it's not fantastic, but I feel like it's a piece of the puzzle I need to listen to in order to be able to um, get the most out of the Defenders. And then real quick, because I'm coming up on that half hour mark where my camera does weird things, um, stuff I'm reading. I I've been reading a bunch of fanfic, of course I have, um, but it's pretty much been the same thing and I've been rereading stuff. So 
nothing new and noteworthy in fanfic to talk to you about, but I read an actual physical book um, last weekend. I read Harry Potter and the Cursed Child by John Tiffany and Jack Thorne. So, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. I'm glad I read it. I mean, this is the screenplay, so it didn't take me long at all. Or screenplay, rehearsal, script, whatever. It's probably written the same way. Um, so I'm glad that I read it, and I'm glad that I read it so long after the hype. Because when it first came out, everybody was talking about it. Everybody was talking about it. And if I had read it then, I would have hated it. Because <laughs> I know myself. And, like, as I get to, like, where things are starting to resolve themselves, or, like, the, the final confrontation is about to happen, I'm sitting there going, I would have hated this a year ago. <laughs> I would have hated it. Um, but reading it now, when everybody who's been, you know, who's been talking about it has already read it and they've kind of died down on it, it was all right. Was it fantastic? No. Um, but it wasn't awful. I liked it better than Deathly Hallows, uh, but that's not saying much because I really hated Deathly Hallows. <laughs> um, it's the kind of thing, while reading it, I thought to myself, I've read so many fanfics that are better than this one. Because technically this is, because it wasn't written by the original author. It's not a part of the actual series. It's extended universe, if you like. Um, would it make a really good show to go see? I don't know. Um, I've heard that it's a great show to go see. Uh... Would I care enough to go see it myself? Probably not, uh, unless it was somewhere really local to me. Like, really local. Like, Waterbury, maybe. <laughs> um, but there were definitely things about it I liked. I... I liked Albus and Scorpius's friendship. Um, I mean, I knew they were... When you read fanfic, you kind of pick up the extra context clues anyway. So I had a, a basic understanding of um, these kids and the types of characters that they were based on how fans were writing them. But I did like Scorpius and Albus's friendship. And I did like Scorpius's um, kind of optimistic nerdery, <laughs> which is delightful. Uh, I was annoyed by some things, mostly by the antagonist, um, because I think there are better ways to create an antagonist than um, having everything relate back to the main baddie of the series. I think there are plenty of bad people in the universe that you can have multiple bad people and have them completely unrelated to each other. Not everything is about old snake face. That annoyed me. But um, am I surprised by that? No. So, I mean, that's my feelings on Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. It was okay. I've read better fanfic. Um, I've read a lot of really good fanfic, guys. It's really hard to top fanfic. Because, for one, it's free. And anything can happen. You can 
write it yourself and tailor make it to what you want. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, that's really it. Trying to read more books. I'm always saying that, but I don't know, but that's it. Um, that's really it for the podcast too. Um, so I'm going to sign off and let you go. Show notes to this episode and all episodes are over at freakishlemon.com. Join us at the Ravelry group. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab. You'll find us. Check out the blanket make along. Come join it before it ends. Um, so you can get in for the last prize drawing. It's a big prize drawing. Um, if you'd like, you can follow me as Freakish Lemon at all the fun places like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Ravelry. And links to all those things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube and you want to follow along with my stuff, hit subscribe. This way you know when the next episode's going to be up. And that's it. I'm going to let you go. Goodbye.